Yeah. The passage we're looking at is in John 8 and verse 5. I mean 15, 8, 15. And in, the, in my Bible, in my King James, it says this, as you judge after the flesh, I judge no man. Short verse, but it speaks about the content and, and intent of the entire Bible. Uh, what, what's the purpose of this book? When you get down to it, it'll, lots and lots of stuff here, but what's really the purpose of the book? And I'm just going to give it to you in a short sentence. The purpose of this book really is to point out our insufficiency to save ourselves Amen. so that we will turn to Christ, whose name is salvation in the Old Testament, his name is Jesus in the New Testament. But the whole purpose of the book is to to show us that we fail, that we need a Savior. That's what the purpose of the book is. So let's talk about that, the Bible, uh, and, and looking at and thinking about what this verse in John chapter 8 says. <clears throat> what is the source of the Bible? The Bible makes it very clear that the source is God. God inspired people to write down the words that we have in this book. Now you could say, well, it was written by men. Well, if that's all you believe, then that's probably as far as your faith will go too. It was men were inspired by God to write down the words of God so that we would know perfectly what God thinks and expects of us. Now, there's lots of rules in, in the book. Matter of fact, the entire book of Leviticus is rules for the priesthood. There's rules in the New Testament about who can be a church leader and who can't, which are quoted too often uh, in uh, 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, and in Titus uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. And often misunderstood... Because people don't know the Hebrew and Greek that goes along with it. So we take, we take in the Word of God and, and use it in error. Jesus is even called a deacon in Romans 15.8. That's what he's called. Lots of rules. But how we apply those rules is what makes the difference. <clears throat> Not only lots of rules, but there are lots of commands in the Bible. Now, there's so many, I couldn't add them all up. I, I just couldn't run through and, 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 and find all of the Greek imperatives uh, and, and sum them all up. That would be just the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are three words that are used that says God caused this to happen which are, are, are literally uh, commands. And that's the, the Greek verbs that are hiphil, H-I-P-H-I-L, hopal, H-O-P-A-L, and hithpael, H-I-T-H-P-A-E-L. Now those words don't mean a whole lot to you, but there's three, Greek, th three Hebrew forms in the Old Testament and, and one in the New Testament that all issue commands to us. And they're used frequently. Frequently. It's telling us we must do this. It's a command. Of course, there's also laws. Not only rules and commands, but there's laws that we have to follow. And what do the laws do? They show that we're being obedient to God. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, the first 43 verses are laws. There's even laws about we should not serve other gods in, in Deuteronomy 16, uh, verses 21 through 17, 20. But the word law is used 459 times in the Old Testament. That's a lot of laws. 
So it's the source of what Jesus is talking about here. You all, according to the flesh, consistently judge. We're judging based on what's written in the book. In these laws and rules and commands. Wrong use of the book. That's what we have to understand. That's the wrong use of the book. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So for us to point out somebody else's sins is saying, you know, you're worse than I am. And there's nobody worse than you and I. That's wrong use of the book. The biblical use of how we're supposed to use the book. In Bible terminology, we're supposed to eat this. We're supposed to consume it. Now that's a figure of speech, but he's saying, I want you to put this in you. Put this in you. So what we do is we read it. And if we get good enough, we can quote some of it. If we're not good enough, we can just paraphrase it. I'm a paraphraser. Nancy's a, a quoter. But it's just the way God made us. He said, I want you to put the book in so you'll know what it says. And when the time comes and something comes up, you'll have a reference point from which to work out being obedient. He said, I want you to be obedient so you put the book in and when things come up, then you know what to do. Now the Bible talks about what we can use the book for. And I want you to understand this. The Bible never. Now do you understand the word never? That means never ever. Not never ever. Does it say use this book to condemn somebody else? You will not find that. That's unbiblical use of the book. It does not say go condemn somebody. Go quote this verse to them and tell them what they're doing wrong. That's not what the book says. The Bible does say to praise God in all situations and circumstances. Both Old Testament and New Testament. 216 times in the Old Testament the word praise is used. 150 of them are in the book of Psalms alone. And what was David called? A man after God's own heart. More times in the book of Psalms than any place else. And David's the one that was called a man after God's own heart. So that tells us if we want to be people after God's own heart, we should be praising people and not condemning people. Does everybody do right? No, they don't. The Bible says all have sinned. Since we're all sinners, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to build them up anyway. That's what really the Bible says. The intent. We've got a book that's the source of all of our problems because it tells us what we've done wrong. And our problem, our biggest problem is we use the book to beat everybody else on the head with. And we shouldn't be doing that. So what's the real intended use of this book? How should we use the Bible? The most often thing we do is condemn people with it. And that needs to change. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there doing drugs and living in sin and sex and child abuse. and I mean, you just go on and name it. Just, the list goes on and on and on. The Bible says never once, not never once, go tell them they're doing wrong and condemn them. Just doesn't say that. That needs to change. If you and I are going to be effective witnesses of the gospel and the true message that's presented in the Bible, then we need to find the good stuff in life and praise God and give people hope that God loves them 
in spite of the fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God actually meant it, meant this book to bring lost people to repentance. Because if you read the book, you know you've broken lots of laws, lots of commands, and, and, and lots of rules. And that brings us to a point of repentance and changing how we live so that we can become members of the kingdom and not excluded from the kingdom. And too many people want to exclude everybody by condemning them. What we need to do is encourage them and tell them everybody's out of way. Everybody's got problems. Everybody's got sins. And help them to find the answer to get in the kingdom. You know, the, I think I was driving into town today and the church up there had a sign up that said uh, the real answer to life was nailed to the cross. And that's the truth. Yeah. The key to the gateway, the key to the gateway of heaven was nailed to the cross. Uh, what we need to do is help people find the key. And you can't do that by condemnation. You do that by praise. It seems like, well, I gotta tell them all the stuff they did wrong before they'll figure out that they need. No, you don't. You need to praise them and build them up and show them Jesus that way. That's the way God says do it. Ultimately, you understand this? When there is no more time for repentance, when there is no more time to get into the kingdom of heaven, all that is written in this book will be used to condemn those that are going to hell because they ignored it. It'll be used against them. Then, and only then, according to the Bible. That's the proper use of this. Keep it in perspective. This is to condemn everybody that's going to go to hell. But it's to help save all those that are going to go to heaven. And you don't save them by condemning them. It's interesting that in this verse, Jesus says that he's not going to condemn anybody. But later on in the Bible, it says that he's, he's the one that's going to sit on the judgment seat. So we're living between that time when Jesus says, I'm not going to condemn anybody, and the time when he's going to condemn all those that are going to hell. Now the church has come up with a real fancy name for that, and this is called a period of grace. We live in the period of grace. And you can't live in the period of grace and go around beating everybody in the head with your Bible. That's just contrary to what the purpose is. Jesus says, I'm not going to judge anybody right now. But later on, that's my job, is to give everybody the judgment they deserve. And if we don't have the blood of Christ covering us, we're going to go through that judgment. And those that don't have the blood of Christ covering them are going to go through that judgment. So it's up to us now to help them see that Jesus is the answer to staying in, on the upside of heaven instead of the downside of hell. That's our job. They got to get it right. Accept Jesus. It, it doesn't mean that once you accept Jesus as your Savior, you're going to start doing everything right. Heaven, Betsy, I mean, there's plenty of people out there that are Bible-believing Christians who have Jesus in their heart, who are going through life still doing a lot of stuff wrong. I would much rather condemn them and say, you know, you you don't have Jesus in your heart. I know because the Bible says if you did, you wouldn't treat me like that or you wouldn't treat so-and-so like that. Or, but you and I don't know. God's grace is what's going to rule during this age. And just before the judgment seat, he's going to send his angels out to separate the sheep and the goats. It's all in the Bible. That's what it says. The wheat and the tares. The tares are going to be thrown into the lake of fire and the wheat is going to be harvested into the kingdom. It all makes sense. Jesus says, we judge according to the flesh constantly. We constantly judge according to the flesh. We read this and our flesh says, 
well, that's wrong. They ain't, you can't do that. And so we go tell somebody that. That's flesh. That's not grace. He said, but I continually do not judge anyone. Not even one. Yet. The word yet is not there. But we know it's, it's a fact because it's the judgment seat of Christ. The great white throne judgment is going to be Jesus telling everybody what they did wrong and why they're going to hell. And there will be no answer. It's just, this is what you did, go. This is what you did, go. This is what you did, go. You and I need to be instruments of grace. Instruments of grace. And not be judgmental. Now, if somebody comes up and says to you, I'm a drug dealer and I need you to give me a ride over to so-and-so's house so I can pick up some drugs and you can take me down to the corner of this street and sit there with me while I sell drugs. Obviously, it's going to take for a little bit of judgment on your part to say, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> right. So you understand we have to have a sense of what the Bible says in order to keep us from doing wrong and having somebody else do wrong. But we're not to judge the other person. You know, you go do what you got to do, but I'm going to stay here. That's the bottom line. Jesus is not the judge yet. And you and I shouldn't be either. I'm going to repeat one more time. The Bible never speaks of quoting Scripture to condemn someone. Never. And you and I shouldn't either. Let's close in prayer.